Lee's Invincible. So the Gadgetry Campaign of 1863. This is the second game in the Blue and Grey Campaign series by Worthington Games. The first game is Grant's Gamble, which I played and reviewed last week. Today is the Turn of Lynn's Invincible, and next week I'll review uh, the third volume. This is a series of introductory level war games about the American Civil War. Introductory in the sense that the rules are very simple, new war gamers will be able to understand them very easily. Also, the number of units on the board is very low. Kind of like almost uh, the Napoleonic 20 system. I think there is not much more than 20 units on the board at any given time. Which is good for newer gamers so that well, it's much easier for them to figure things out and to concentrate on the rules and strategy rather than to have to keep in mind the position of 2000 pieces or something like that. But of course, introductory war games should also be interesting for seasonal war gamers. And the first volume in this system had that advantage in fact that it was something that a newer gamer could have played but also it had enough interesting decisions in it that a seasoned war gamer could find enough reasons for interest in the game. Um, in my previous review, the one for Grant's Gamble, I talked about the basic system um, but I'm gonna give you here pretty much a quick rundown of the basic ideas behind the game system, the core system that is shared with all games um, in the, within the system, and then I'll talk about the specific elements that Lee's Invincible introduces. Now, there's a block game, so units on the board are represented by wooden blocks and that will be standing up and facing the owning player, so the opponent only sees where your units are, but not exactly what they are. Units have a number of hit points, health points, life points, call them whatever you want. And the current number is the one that is on top of the block, depending on the current orientation of the block. When the unit takes a hit, it is rotated to indicate that fact to the lower value when the unit is replenished, is rotated the other way. By the way, not in this game, in this specific game there are no replacements, so every hit counts, every hit is pretty dramatic. Uh, units also have a value here that indicates the number of dice that they roll in combat, this is the morale, which is used for morale tests, and units in this game are also represented by multiple blocks. They are large, so there are multiple blocks. Uh, when you have a higher block, say, there will be a block for this unit whose lowest number is 5. When that unit is down to 5 and takes a further hit, the block is replaced by this other block, represent the same unit, but simply at a different level of strength, at a lower level of strength. Units are placed on the board, as I said, they are activated during a player's turn. At the beginning of each turn, the players roll to determine the number of uh, points, of command points that they have for that turn. That number indicates the number of units that they can move. So if I have three combat points, I can move three units. After players have determined the number of points that they receive, they can use those points to activate units. Units are activated for movement, they have different amounts of movement points. There's a point-to-point -point map, so moving to each location consumes a movement point. You activate your units for movement, you move them, and at the end of movement you resolve battle in all areas that con in all locations that contain blocks belonging to both players. You also have leaders, and leaders in the system have special, unique abilities, and each game will tell you what the specific abilities for that leader are in that game. When you resolve battle, you move the pieces involved in battle on this main display here, on this battle display here, defender and attacker. There are different areas depending on the terrain that the attacker used. So some blocks will be placed in the mountain, if they cross the mountain, some in the river area, and you may be able to resolve a battle with blocks coming from different directions, so it's not impossible that some blocks will come directly in this area here, some blocks of the attacker, in case they simply move through clear terrain, and maybe some units will have crossed the river, so they will be placed here. Units that join a battle, crossing a river, walking through mountains, have a penalty because they roll one fewer dice in the first round of combat. If there are multiple rounds of combat, then the blocks of the attackers that come from these areas are placed here. 
You roll dice for each unit that is involved in combat. Defender rolls first and applies hit. You roll dice depending on the number of dice that the units roll. Each six is a hit. You uh, reduce the effectiveness, the strength of the opponent by the number of hits, then the opponent fires back. Each unit that takes a hit will have to take a morale test. If the morale test is failed, the unit goes in the fail morale. And we're talking about modifiers. Uh, there are also some fortified cities. If the defender is in those cities, then there is, uh, there is an advantage also. Now, uh, you will go back and forth uh, attacking and resolving hits until uh, one of the two players well, is completely annihilated and the battle is over. It may also be that all of the surviving pieces of a player in the failed morale here, in that case the player is forced to retreat, it's a devastating proposition because the opponent gets to fire at you at full strength with all of their blocks. You may also choose to retreat willingly in which case uh, things are less dire, each block of the opponent rolls one die, not the number of dice that they would roll. You're going to take some fire if you retreat, but if you decide to retreat, then the damage is much lower. Now, about this game specifically, about this implementation of the system. First, there aren't many special rules. There are even uh, less unique rules than in Grant's Gamble, where there was, for example, a rule about building trenches. Mm, no trenches here. The only real rule has to do with the commanders of the Union player. The Union player starts with Hooker being the main commander, then you roll dice, and at some point Hooker um, may, most likely will be, replaced by Mean, who has better ratings, has better chances of getting extra command points during a turn. Each, each leader has a different uh, rating for that. Other than that, surprisingly after playing the previous game, the leaders don't really have any specific aspect to them. In the previous game, uh, Grant's Gamble, the leaders have special powers, special abilities. Not these leaders here. Um, so I guess that their main use is simply to deceive the opponent so that this becomes a generic block that may or may not be a unit. So that allows you to try to trick the opponent. Uh, into believing that you have a different numbers of units in an area that you actually do. As for the map and the objectives, this is about Lee moving north and Lee and Confederate units at the beginning of the game will start from the south in this area here and facing a big wall of Union units around this area. The um, the Union player is trying to defend, of course, well, everything, but especially the areas north of the Potomac, and of course, you also want to protect Washington, D.C. Also, Baltimore is a juicy target for the Confederates. The Confederate player will score points by occupying key locations, such as D.C. or Baltimore, and or by having number a certain number of units north of the Potomac that also are in supply, that can draw supply lines to supply sources in the south. So the Le Le Confederate player wants to move north and the, um, the Union player is trying to stop them. Not so easy because uh, things can get slippery. The uh, Confederate player, uh, the Union player may use carry screenings to try to slow down or stop the Confederate player, but the Confederate player can really uh, try to drive north and to split in different groups, uh, try to push in different areas um, or from different directions to go north. And like it was historically, Washington DC was such an important target and is such an important target here. That in a certain sense, the strategy of the Union player is somewhat warped around that. You always had to worry about DC. And so, as the Union player, you vastly outnumber the Confederate player, you have numbers, you have strength, you have everything, but you also have a lot of areas that you want to cover. And it's very hard to cover everything because, well, you may choose to, uh, yes, defend DC and put a powerful line of defense around here, then the, the, the Confederate player may slip through that section of the map and plays units in the north that also scores points can have a quick drive onto Baltimore 
but then you decide well then I'm gonna try to block everything I'm gonna put a whole line here to prevent any sort of invasion that also is a problem because then your line is staying and the confederate player is a number but if the confederate player does concentrate units in a specific area can punch a hole through a overstretch line of union units and then can reach DC can reach other areas so it's it's hard to so you have as a union player an advantage numerically but the map is still large enough with a nice number of connections that it does allow the confederate player to run north and to try to conquer objectives so the union player has some interesting challenges here uh, I would only, I was gonna say that the Union player plays reactively to what the uh, the Confederate player does. This is what you have in most games that have a strong attacker defender defender dichotomy. You see where the, the attacker goes. But this is not just that, actually also the confederate player will react a lot to that. So you have the strong attacker defender dichotomy, but I, don't, I didn't get the sense that you have a player which is just the reactive player and a player that is the active player. The confederate player uh, has to really pay attention to what the union player does and if then the uh, the main bulk of the action moves to this area uh, well then sometimes you will have sort of like a cat and mouse type of situation people running around like a game of tag of confederate and and union units around here and the confederate player well all the confederate player has to do is to survive and stay up there the longer you stay the more disruption you're causing economically and politically to the union so you're scoring points so I found that it's a game that has some really interesting dynamics and this is, and this is really uh, thanks to the map where that has an interesting net of connections that allows you to move around a lot and to, and also thanks to the low number of units. I mean, having a low count of units keeps things manageable, of course, but also creates a challenge if one of the two players is trying to cover a lot of ground to protect a lot of ground and simply there aren't enough units to do so. So I found it interesting in that uh, for such a simple game, there definitely are different ways in which the game can play out. The game can have a strong focus around this area and this area, or most likely the game can go in different directions so that there will be a group of confederate units trying to draw through Washington as maybe another group of units is simply trying. Oh gosh, the camera almost fell. Maybe you will have another group of units that are driving, there you go, that are pushing in different directions. Uh, it's so, I found that it's not just that you have a single action, you have groups of actions, you have foci of actions in different areas as different objectives, different possible ways of scoring points for the confederate player uh, become available Will the windows of opportunity open. And so uh, maybe you do have a group of units that seems to be going in a strong march against DC, against DC and then they'll turn and try to go somewhere else and grab Baltimore, which also is a good objective. They look like they're going there, maybe they'll maneuver the opponent, then the Union player starts moving units to try to intercept before they get to Baltimore and then they spread out here, making it easier for them to, to disrupt this area and score points. So I just found that you have different game styles almost that um, that uh, can be embraced by the players, explored in different moments. From some time concentrating force uh, to some trying trying to to cover as much terrain as possible. Um, fun actually that's a game that has a surprising variety of gameplay and gameplay that again changes flavor in a sense throughout a single game uh, while still um, and you have this in a set of rules that is pretty simple that is very simple very linear very intuitive and fast-paced I roll my action points I have three four five action points move around, do my thing, resolve a battle, maybe, maybe not, some battles are small and real quick, the opponent goes, and so on and so forth. So it's not a game that has any paralysis, not a game that has any problems in terms of pace. Fun, a lot, nice puzzle, nice puzzle for both the Union player and the Confederate player. 
with this small number of units um, the fog of war is fairly limited after a while you will get a sense of where the units of the opponent are and what the units are so it is also a game that works perfectly well if you played solitaire simply with the units face up that sounds like blasphemy for block war gamers but it works what can I say uh, I'm sorry if it goes against your theology of block war games but the pragmatic player me says I played it that way it was super fun it was a really nice interesting puzzle for both sides so that side uh, that way of playing is to be legitimate because it works because it's fun Lee's Invincibles I actually enjoyed it even more than Grant's Gamble I wasn't sure because the rules were so linear that I was afraid there was not going to be enough historical flavor but the historical flavor is simply given by the composition of the armies and by the map by the challenges that the map creates when you have such a low count of units available to do all of the many things that you want to do Lee's Invincibles fun highly recommend as an introductory war game Definitely another great installment in the Blue and Grey campaign series by Worthington Games.